Welcome, one and all, to The Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. First of all, I'm going to start... Let me start by saying Happy President's Day, everybody. Happy the day when we... when we commemorate George Washington and Abraham Lincoln getting half off on a microwave at Sears. <laughs> Sears... We're still a store. It was a big President's Day for our current president because early this morning, Biden made a surprise visit to Kiev. Yeah! Boom. There you go. I assume it was only a surprise to us <laughs> and not to the Ukrainians. <laughs> Incoming! It appears Russia is attacking Kiev with a very slow-moving white walker. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. False alarm. We have subdued him with butterscotch. <laughs> A flawless Ukrainian it accent. Is. That was a flawless <laughs> Ukrainian accent. See, uh, this is seriously impressive, though. Biden risked a secret trip to a war zone to show our allies he's got their back, unless, unless he went there to find Hunter Biden's other laptop. <laughs> no. no, it's the ally thing. It's the ally right. thing. Now, due to security concerns, no one knew about the trip. Biden left under cover of darkness, departing on Air Force One for Poland at 4.15 a.m. And just to throw everybody off his trail, back at the White House, he left a decoy Pillow Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> same skin tone, same base of skin tone. <laughs> Upon arrival in Kyiv, Biden got straight to business, meeting with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Here they are, two world leaders, looking like your dad meeting your boyfriend and then <laughs> deciding, deciding he's okay even though he wears cargo pants to church. <laughs> Biden joined Zelensky for a tour of Kyiv and announced an additional $460 million in military aid, which Ukraine clearly needs because during the visit, air raid sirens went off. Look at that. Air raid sirens are blaring, and Joe stays cool as a cucumber, okay? <laughs> that, my friends, that is bravery. Last time we had a fire drill at the office, I pushed an intern down the stairs. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. He got college credit for that. <laughs> and I like to think he learned something, too. Specifically, get the <laughs> out of my way. <laughs> okay? True story. True story? Uh, is that a true story? I don't know if that's a true story. They're still dealing with a catastrophic a train derailment down in East Palestine, Ohio. And we're learning more about the failures that led up to it. And I'll tell you who didn't help, the administration of the former president. You see, in 2018, they repealed a rule that would require some trains carrying hazardous substances to upgrade their braking systems, arguing that the cost of requiring these brakes was not economically justified. Well... No, 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 no. Give them a chance. Now they found a cheaper alternative. Replacing all the dirt in Ohio. <laughs> it turns out that that Obama-era rule would likely not have prevented this derailment because thanks to intense lobbying by Norfolk Southern and other railroads, a train is considered high hazard only if it's going faster than 30 miles per hour with at least 70 loaded tank cars containing certain highly flammable liquids. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's good. 70 tanker cars full of vinyl chloride, a clear hazard. 69 is totally fine. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna guess that one tanker of vinyl chloride is pretty dangerous. You shouldn't put any hazardous chemicals on a train unless the brakes are working real good. All right? It's a lesson we all learned as children in the classic book, The Little Engine That Could Turn Ohio Into a Vast Wasteland. <laughs> now... Norfolk Southern. I think I can. 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 Norfolk Southern does a lot of lobbying against regulations. Their newest mission has been to defeat a proposed federal rule that would require trains, in most cases, to have two crew members. Well, yeah. Every train should have at least two crew members and four boxcar children to solve mysteries. One person who's not making things better over at Norfolk Southern is CEO and stock photo result when you type nothing into the search field. (laughs) 
Alan Shaw. <laughs> Over the weekend, Shaw visited East Palestine and tried to do some damage control. Here he is explaining what happened to the polluted soil and liquids that were removed from the crash site. We're taking it to landfills that are designed to handle that type of material. What city and state? I don't have that information. You don't know where they're going? No. Even if he did know, he's never going to tell you. No state wants to advertise they're getting millions of tons of toxic dirt. Uh, where did it come from? Does it really matter? Enjoy your flaming ski mountain. <laughs> now, flaming. Wow. Flaming ski see mountain. It. See it. Mount Fire. It's Disney on fire. <laughs> Norfolk Southern restarted train service through East Palestine a week ago, and Shaw tried to reassure residents that it was safe. He failed. We worked with the Ohio EPA to make sure that it was safe okay, to so operate that, in that area. So none of the soil underneath the rail lines is contaminated? I, di I didn't say that. <laughs> not, not great. Uh, we are working with Ohio police to make sure there are no more chainsaw murders in the area. So you caught the guy with the chainsaw? I didn't say that. <laughs> we tried to, but the chainsaw lobby is super powerful. <laughs> Shaw even managed to put a positive spin on the toxic plume that resulted from the controlled burn of the chemical spill. Shaw says he was at the meeting in person on the Monday after the derailment in which the decision for a controlled release was made. And what was his reaction when he saw the result and the cloud of smoke rising into the sky? Frankly, that, that told us that there was success. Yes. We all know the famous saying, where there's smoke, there's success. In general... <laughs> I'd say the interview went off the rails, but for Norfolk Southern, that's on brand. There you go. Get it. Get it. We got an update on those unidentified airborne objects that the military blowed up real good. Uh, these things, uh, we all heard, entered our airspace, and they were deemed such a threat that we scrambled stealth fighter jets. So clearly, the security of the planet depends on learning what exactly they were, which is why this weekend the government called off the search for the unidentified objects it shot down. What? That seems really suspicious. But what are you going to do? you got to trust the official government statement. There is no threat to national security, as we've been assured by our slender, featureless captors, who are feeding us a fattening slurry of grains and acorns. Hail Gorlock. <laughs> Gorlock's a good guy. I hear, I hear Gorlock's a good guy. You'd like him. Huh? Solid guy, Gorlock. Granted, these debris recovery missions were difficult. In Alaska, Navy pilots faced punishing terrain and weather conditions, causing them to end their mission with no answers near the town of Dead Horse. <laughs> Before the Navy made it rain Sidewinder missiles, of course, the town was called Happy Alive Horse. <laughs> so... <laughs> not just Alive Horse, Happy Alive Horse. Very important. So we know nothing about the Alaska UFO from February 10th, but there's also that Yukon UFO from February 11th where we may have a lead because some now believe the sinister object may have been a party-style balloon. <laughs> Tiger to renegade, Tiger to renegade, I got a bogey in my sight. Seems to be broadcasting a message. Happy Bar Mitzvah, Aaron. There's also gathering evidence that the source of this inflatable menace could be a hobby group called the Northern Illinois Bottle Cap Balloon Brigade. <laughs> Their motto, let's start a war with China. <laughs> but uh, it's just fun. Fathers and kids, yeah, something to do on the weekends. Dads and, dads and kids. Oh, there's breaking news from the nation's capital, New York City. A new study shows, <laughs> new study shows that fecal bacteria is <laughs> rampant on New York sidewalks. So the next time your toddler throws a tantrum and hurls himself on the ground, just leave him there and get a new kid. <laughs> just cut your losses. Just, it's been great. It's been great. <laughs> the purpose of the study was to establish how much dog poop footwear carries into homes. Oh, oh, I know. Too much. <laughs> That's why you should only walk the streets of New York barefoot. And when you come in, put on the shoes to protect your floor. <laughs> Gathering the data involved researchers using tape to collect samples 
and crouching on the sidewalk with sterile pipettes. <laughs> they were just following the scientific method. Observe. Question every life choice that has led you to this moment. Crouch on the sidewalk, putting poopy tape into a bag. Now, that's it. I believe that was Galileo who came up with that. However dirty you think New York sidewalks are, they're worse because they found 31,000 fecal bacteria per sample of pooled rainwater on city sidewalks. To which the bacteria said, yeah, it's a little cramp, but that's the price you pay to live in the greatest sidewalk in the world. We got a great show for you tonight. My guest is Senator Bernie Sanders. But when we come back, I am spilling the tea on the hottest new youth trends. It'll toast and you shook. No cap. <laughs>